my name is Tom Petter. I'm the professor, associate professor of Old Testament, and I chair the Division of Biblical Studies. So I was roped in to do this <laughs> at the last minute. Amen. <laughs> and uh, it just by, ver by way of introduction, I'll be very brief, but by way of introduction, I could tell you about biblical theology as a discipline that stands between exegesis and systematic theology. Systematic theology is a logical categorizing of scriptural truth. Biblical theology is an, is an historical development. So we always talk about from Genesis to Revelation. So the historical development of doctrine within the canon. So that's biblical theology. And unless you've been living under um, a rock, Gordon Conwell has a long standing tradition to study biblical theology going back to Meredith Klein, and kind of all roads lead to Klein around here. <laughs> and just a, a towering figure, the late Meredith Klein. And uh, so we, we're very thankful for his work. And, and today we have uh, three scholars, and I was thinking, wonderful to have them here. And then I was thinking about all the others on faculty. Amen who could be there as well, Gordon Hugenberger, Carol Kaminsky, uh, and others as well. So it's, it's a rich tradition. So we could talk about what it is, but I want to talk about the value of biblical theology for ministry and preaching because that's what we're training ourselves to do. And it provides coherence to a framework. You can put the exegetical minutia into a larger framework. And don't we all need that, a sense of perspective? When you're faced with difficult text, the, the ability to put them in an historical continuum from Genesis to Revelation. And as a preacher, teacher, student, counselor, whatever ministry that God, God has called you to, the, that, this ability to step back and see a particular part in light of the whole is an essential dimension of being able to communicate the gospel well in our culture. So it's, we're in for a treat. So uh, we have Dr. Richard Lins, who is our dean, and also the author of Identity and Idolatry, The Image of God in Its Inversion. And as a Bible guy, I was really impressed <laughs> with the book. And I mean that in, a, in the best possible sense, how the exegetical insights and the theological depth. And then, of course, our own Dr. Niehaus, who was not satisfied to just write one volume of his biblical theology, <laughs> but two, and now three, I hear. So very productive uh, scholar in our midst. And then Dr. McDonough, New Testament professor, Christ as creator, origins of a New Testament doctrine. So that's steeped into the tradition. So. Enough of my little introduction. So, Dr. Lentz. I think we're going to start with Dr. Niehaus and then Dr. Mandana, uh, and finally me. Okay, is this, is this on? No. <laughs> well, as for three volumes, I think of Kalimachus, who said, uh, great book is a great evil. A big book is a big evil. So, <laughs> but anyway, you write what you're called to write. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Petter, for that introduction. I think that sort of set the table well. Um, I'd like to go on adding to the table setting here by noting that um, one way of approaching biblical theology, uh, a very normal way because it fits the data, is to look at the divine human covenants and how God progressively deals with people through those covenants. Um, and uh, I wanted to uh, sort of follow those through briefly and uh, see if this will work. Is this, uh, this isn't on even, is it? It is on. Okay, I think I need technical assistance <laughs> immediately here. Um, They're working in the back. Let me to just, get... let me, let me just uh, talk while this is waiting um, and say that there, what is normally known as covenant theology is uh, a way of looking at what is, what is normally known as covenant theology is a way of looking at the covenants that uh, 
really was developed in the 17th century uh, with Johannes Koch, uh, usually called by his Latin name Cocheus, and you find it in the Westminster Confession that you have an Adamic covenant, which was a covenant of works uh, because uh, apparently Adam could have done the work. He, ha he was without sin. But after the fall, there's need for grace, and so you have all the other divine human covenants which were referred to as a covenant of grace under that schema. Um, tell me when you think that looks good, okay? Um, and so the first thing on this uh, page here illustrates that perspective. <clears throat> and uh, this is what I was taught by Meredith Klein when I was here, since uh, Klein was mentioned. And uh, I think that that was a good uh, way of looking at things, a reasonable way of looking at things in the 17th century before people understood what covenants and covenants renewals really were in the ancient world. But we know more now, and one thing that's become very clear is that the Noahic covenant is a renewal of the Adamic covenant. And so both of these covenants apply to all people. They're still in effect. We know this. The, there's nothing, there's no biblical statement that either of them has been abrogated. Um, you have uh, people continue to be fruitful and multiply. They continue to rule over the earth and so on, but in a sinful way, out of step with the Spirit. So the Noahic Covenant renews the Adamic. <clears throat> and uh, the problem then that that presents with this schema is that in the ancient world, a covenant and its renewal formed one legal package. And so the Noahic Covenant is a common grace covenant. It's the Lord's covenants with people and all the earth. The Adamic Covenant, of course, was the same. Um, if you, you know well enough, I think, that Genesis 9, 1 through 3 basically repeats Genesis 1, 28, and that's something that people understood for a long time, pointed to the reality of, a, of an Adamic covenant. I'll just add here, um, this is something that's going to, from the appendix of my second volume, and, uh, I'm, well, you have it on your table, so I'm not going to try to adjust the equipment here, but the point of this is that the discovery of the Hittite treaty form showed us, and this was understood first in the mid-1950s, that the divine human covenants in the Bible, in the Pentateuch mostly, um, have this same form. And so that, that's very good to know. Uh, in terms of Mosaic authorship, it points to the reasonableness of a Mosaic date for the Pentateuch because that's the form of treaty and covenant that was being used in Moses' day. It wasn't used later in the first millennium. That's not proof, but it certainly points in that direction. But the point for our purposes here is that we have further evidence for an Adamic covenant because those elements are pretty much uh, to be found in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. So there you are probably aware there's a school of thought. It's a minority view that there was not an Adamic covenant, but there are plenty of lines of evidence that would suggest there were. And so for, for these purposes, we're going to affirm that, that, that there was an Adamic covenant, um, and that's some of the evidence that points to it. Well, if we come back to this then, the real situation is that we have the Adamic covenant, it's renewed with a later generation, namely that of Noah and the Noahic covenant. Those are common grace covenants. And so the whole world continues under those. They will continue in effect, I would submit, until the world ends. And then we'll have a new heaven and earth, and the covenants that apply to the old heaven and earth won't matter anymore. The Noahic covenant, for instance, provides for murder uh, that's not going to be an issue in the new earth, I think, uh, when we're go all going to be like the Lord because we behold him. So that's the context, the common grace context. Is that clear to folks? Is there anyone to whom it's not clear? Well, I guess we'll have questions later. But uh, just important to understand that because that's the foundation. The Lord keeps the world going so that his special grace program can proceed. And that begins with Abraham. That's the Abrahamic covenant. And if you're familiar with that material at all, you know that um, the Abrahamic covenant contains promises or foreshadowings of the other divine human covenants. Um, at the end of Genesis 15, as Meredith Klein was fond of pointing out and championed the view, and it's gradually caught on over the decades. It took some time as, as I read the scholarship, but the view that, that when that flaming fire pot and torch passes between the pieces of the animals, that was the Lord passing between the pieces. 
That was the way that treaties were often ratified in the ancient world. And the symbolism was, usually it was the vassal that passed between the pieces. The symbolism was that if I, the vassal, break the treaty, may the same, fault, uh, same fate befall me that befell these animals. In this case, the Lord passes between them, which symbolizes if there's covenant breaking, Abram, by you or your offspring, I, the Lord, will take the punishment on myself. Uh, many of you are familiar with this, uh, no doubt. But that's so that the Abrahamic covenant in that way foreshadows the new. Uh, in that same passage, he promises that in the fourth generation, Abraham's descendants are going to come back and inherit the land. They're going to conquer it. Mm -hmm. That happens under the Mosaic covenant. So that's foreshadowing the Mosaic situation. Also, the animals that Abraham uses are the ones that are later prescribed for Levitical sacrifices and offerings. So it's foreshadowing the law in that sense. It foreshadows the Davidic covenant because in Genesis 17, when the, when the covenant sign is given, excuse me, um, the Lord promises that kings will proceed from Abraham. And of course, eventually that is David. And uh, the Davidic covenant also promising that David's offspring will build the temple and there will always be someone on the throne of Israel, as supernally there always is, the son, the true David. Um, uh, that foreshadows the new covenant. So these covenants, as you look at them, the special grace program, uh, they all work together, they progress together, they all lead to, promise, anticipate, and culminate in the new covenant. And so that's the general schema. That, I would submit, is sort of the backbone uh, on the basis of which biblical theology is and should be built and, uh, and uh, constructed and developed. One thing about covenants that I'll say, and we're, we're agreed on about 10 minutes here, so... There will be time for questions later. But one thing about covenants that I think is really important to understand is that any divine human covenant is an expression of the nature of God. And so you always see in these covenants his love, his care, his provision, his perseverance. No human behavior can cancel any of these covenants. The most egregious case would be Israel, who sinned terribly, right? And in, in Hosea 2, you even read about that covenantal relationship, the Lord talks, is talking about it in terms of divorce. So you think, well, that's it. The, the Lord's going to put an end to this covenant. But we know that Jesus was born under the law, so that did not end. So there's just remarkable goodness and faithfulness shown in all of these covenants, and each one of them reveals more of the nature of God and his salvific intent for people. Uh, so that's a great basis, I think, for biblical theology, and I'll hand it on to my New Testament colleague here. Yeah, I, I don't have any visuals, so fiat looks. <laughs> um, I'm going to shift the uh, tenor of the discussion a bit here and th speak more in methodological terms of the relationship between uh, the Bible and theology and, and biblical theology. Um, I do this because I think there is a tendency sometimes among students to assume that I can get all the uh, the, the glamour and the uh, awe of a big picture perspective by doing biblical theology without having to deal with all the prolegomena and intellectual systemization and all that sort of thing that kind of bedevils some students of, uh, of dogmatics. And, and the, the reality, whether you take it as good news or bad news, is to do biblical theology, you have to do theology. And so I want to talk about three different ways the term biblical theology could justly be used. And I think in keeping with uh, the novelist Flannery O'Connor's one of the title of her stories is Everything That Rises Must Converge, that we'll see the, the Bible and theology end up being inextricably uh, wedded together. So first we have a biblical theology, which is really just tantamount to exegesis. That The Bible, in its deliverance of divine wisdom, regularly ties the big picture together. Um, just this morning, we were in Colossians 1 in my Interpreting the New Testament class, and we pointed out that in that little hymn to Christ in chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, um, Paul shows that the predicates of Christ in creation, God is the one, Christ is the one through whom God made all things, he's firstborn over all creation, etc., are replicated in the second chunk where it says he's firstborn from the dead, he's the one through whom God reconciled all uh, creation to himself. And then we wanted to demonstrate that throughout the scriptures, the scriptures themselves testify to the fact that in God's economy, his salvific work is tantamount to his creative work. And so the quickest example that springs to mind is in Exodus 14, where the spirit of God, the ruach of God, 
blows across the waters, separates the waters, just as in Genesis 1. Dry land appears, which means uh, life and deliverance for Israel. And so you can't exegete, you can't understand or interpret Exodus 14 without paying attention to what's going on in Genesis 1. The story hangs together quite deliberately by way of authorial intent. And likewise, in the New Testament, you, you really can't step around in the world of the New Testament without stepping into this big perspective of Scripture, sticking with the Exodus motif. In the early chapters of Matthew, we have a quotation, again, from Hosea, where it says, out of Egypt I've called my son. A little infant Jesus is down in Egypt, and then he comes back. And uh, some um, critical interpreters will say that Matthew's kind of engaging in high-handed exegesis here, that this has nothing to do with the uh, little Jesus. It's about the nation of Israel coming out uh, from Egypt in the Exodus. Well, Matthew, believe it or not, is well aware of that fact. And he is quite deliberately setting up uh, the narrative to show that Jesus is, in fact, replicating not only the Exodus, but the history of Israel. He goes into the waters and is baptized, right, in the Jordan. And then he comes out, and what happens? He is tempted for 40 units of time in the wilderness. And he quotes Deuteronomy 6 through 8, which is all about how Israel did uh, in their temptation in the wilderness. Dr. Nias has already hinted that horribly is the answer there. Um, Jesus succeeds where Israel failed. Jesus is indeed replicating, recapitulating, to take a term from uh, the church's arguably their first uh, post-biblical uh, biblical theologian, Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon, uh, recapitulating the history of Israel in his own person. So one way of speaking about biblical theology is simply the theology that the Bible itself offers to us, particularly the big picture, the narrative of Scripture, which both in the Old Testament and the New Testament is regularly rehearsed and caught up into, uh, in this case, the, uh, the person of Jesus himself. Uh, the book of Revelation, uh, Richard Bauckham, my mentor at St. Andrews, uh, has a book entitled uh, on Revelation entitled The Climax of Prophecy, and, and that's what Revelation really is. It's just uh, biblical theology writ large to interpret Revelation is, in fact, to do biblical theology. But there's a kind of transitional zone, and like most transitional zone, it's hard to know exactly when you're moving from one to the other, where we begin to do a little more synthetic work of our own as interpreters. And this is perfectly licit, it's perfectly acceptable sort of a thing to do, it's a good and natural thing to do, but you just want to be aware of what you're doing when you're doing it. To the extent that your exegesis is well grounded and vetted by the community of faith and uh, should be in line with the uh, teaching of the church through the ages, uh, you can say with some degree of confidence, thus, thus saith the Lord. But if, for example, I want to assert that the key theme of biblical theology is the progress of God's kingdom, right? Then I'm making some interpretive decisions which have to be grounded. They have to have some warrant for them. I have to be able to defend them publicly. And at some point that even becomes, I would say, a secondary synthetic exercise, which is then subject to all the review and uh, counterpoints that would obtain in any assertion in the church. Right? And, and, it, and it's precisely in uh, moving from this border, and here I think I'll probably anticipate some of the things Dr. Lintz is going to speak about, uh, just as we move from there, that we have to be careful, not that we stop doing it, but that we do it with appropriate humility and in the recognition that what we are doing is different than simply an exegetical deliverance, something the Bible itself says. Right? And, and so I'm more inclined in this middle zone to say a helpful way to synthesize some aspects of scripture is the progress of the kingdom or something those, along those lines. Because I want to distinguish what I'm saying as a hopefully informed observer versus what the scripture itself can be uh, asserted to affirm. Um, the final step then would be kind of raw dogmatics or theology as we learn it in systematic one, two, and three. And the point here is that good theology has always looked back to the scripture, not simply as atomistic little proof texts to be randomly synthesized according to the intellectual flavors of the moment, but with a deep respect for the flow of the scriptural story. Um, and increasingly, I'm, I'm minded to think that good theology has always been and will be precisely biblical theology. And we'll just bookend it. Uh, I mentioned Irenaeus, but let me take someone even more uh, famous, Augustine, 
uh, whom some think is sort of the quintessential intellectualizer of the faith, will read the City of God. City of God is a narrative drawn largely from the patterns of Scripture, which uh, expresses the progress of God's kingdom. Yeah, it's got some Platonist elements. Uh, it certainly reflects Augustine's particular intellectual and cultural background, but I still think it counts as biblical theology. Uh, bring it up to the 20th century. Karl Barth, who I always like to say is the finest 20th century uh, theologian because he began as a New Testament scholar, not in spite of the fact that, or surprisingly he was. No, he's, he, he's good at what he does because he is uh, a biblical theologian, um, not because he looks like um, Coxius or, or, or um, Gerhardus Voss or anything, but when you really look at what he's making by way of fundamental assertions, I think he really is deeply rooted in the scriptural text. Even his uh, assertions uh, about the paradoxical nature of God's revealing himself even while he conceals himself, I'm increasingly convinced is drawn from reflections on 1 Corinthians 1, that Christ, uh, God's power is fully revealed paradoxically in the cross, which is both a concealing of his divine power, glory, and the ultimate revelation of it. Bart, of course, wrote a commentary on 1 Corinthians, and so um, even when it looks like somebody is doing systematic theology in the most systematized way possible, the good ones are in fact, I think, arguably doing biblical theology. So three different sorts of things, all of which could bear the same name. And we just want to be aware of what we're doing when we're doing it. And I'll hand it over to Dr. Lenz. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Sean. I mean, I, I think just a couple of preliminary points. Uh, all three of us are committed to the project um, in a way that isn't universally held among the theological disciplines, that, that uh, we wrestle with how it is that the Bible is to be read as one book and not merely, uh, not in spite of, but not merely as 66 books. Uh, so that project, it seems to me, is the door then into this conversation. How in the world does uh, the book fit together as a whole? Uh, uh, and Sean's exactly right that the early church was very much committed to this notion as the church has across the ages, that the book does fit together. A, a fundamental intuition. In some ways, in a time like ours that leans uh, pretty strongly into uh, fragmentation, uh, this is counterintuitive uh, in some ways. So Augustine's point that the New Testament is uh, the old, in the old, concealed, uh, that the Old uh, Testament is in the New, revealed. Uh, 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 Irenaeus, Augustine, Athanasius all had this sense that the book uh, held together. And it, its fundamental claim was because God wrote the book. Right? So there's a, there is a, a, a claim here that uh, the divine author uh, is the ground by which we make this claim. Uh, and so uh, it's not, I think, incidental that at every kind of... Um, vibrant period of church history, there is a wrestling with a fresh uh, exposition of the whole message of the Bible. What, what does it mean? Jonathan Edwards, one of my favorite uh, theologians, promised us that his final and ultimate work would be a biblical theology. Uh, actually referred to it uh, of the new heavens and the new earth. He died before it came to pass. He gave us a little bit of glimpse in some of these uh, last sermons of his, but at every period. Now, there, there's a, a sense, though, in which as we use the language of biblical theology, we contrast it in the last 150 years, uh, maybe 200 years, with systematic theology and with exegesis. Uh, uh, leaving that aside, let me just commit to the fact that biblical theology uh, simply refers to the claim that God has disclosed himself across the breadth of the canon. Right? That we, we, in one sense, are trying to hold on to uh, that uh, full, dramatic uh, exposure of God's work. God not only authors the work, but he also is the primary actor in this drama, to use that uh, uh, metaphor. And so uh, the church's claim across the ages that God is the narrator as well as the central actor uh, forces us to wrestle now with uh, what is God doing across the canon. Uh, 
And so uh, just a slight uh, parentheses here. Uh, I think the text itself across uh, many places, we could go lots of different uh, uh, passages, affirms this kind of what we might call double agency understanding of authorship. That is to say that God is fully and finally, ultimately, really, truly, accurately the author of every text. And, not but, and, uh, Moses is genuinely, actually, really, fully, uh, accurately called the author of the Pentateuchal material. It's not an either-or, it's a both-and. So at the end of the Joseph narrative, for example, uh, Joseph says uh, to the brothers, uh, you recall that wonderful, uh, ironic phrase, you meant this for evil, God meant it for good. God intended it, God uh, ordained it. Uh, which is it? Are, are the brothers culpable? It, or is God responsible? Uh, yes. Right? There's the double agency. Uh, 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 finally, a mystery in some sense, uh, but that's the glue, uh, if you will, that holds uh, it together. Uh, lots of folks have defended that. I just mentioned uh, uh, Kevin Van Hooser and Nick Waltersdorf uh, in particular in our time. Uh, calling to mind then uh, uh, a uh, a phrase that a former colleague of ours used to say that to do biblical theology, the primary tool you want to have is a concordance. Uh, that is to say, you want to ask the question how words are used across the breadth of the canon. Uh, I think that's exactly uh, right. Uh, uh, so before you look at a commentary as you prepare a sermon, just uh, uh, as an exercise, Look at the key terms in the text you're preaching on and ask yourself, where else are these same words used? Uh, how else does the author of the passage you're looking at uh, uh, grasp the connections across those passages? We heard this remarkable sermon in, in chapel this morning uh, from uh, Hillary Davis, uh, Robin and Jack's uh, uh, daughter, uh, thinking about the woman caught in adultery. Uh, adultery is this really rich, thick, uh, biblical uh, category. And in one sense, you can't understand what's going on there in John 8 unless you understand uh, lots of not only the ancient Near Eastern concepts of adultery, but what the Mosaic Law says about it. Uh, the simple point uh, the context matters, and the context is not simply the immediate historical context. Um, it seems to me that uh, we err in two directions, uh, if you will, as evangelicals, leaving aside uh, uh, the comments about uh, those outside the evangelical community. It seems to me we do have a tendency to think theologically uh, with the Bible by proof texting simply parachuting down into a passage and asking, what does the passage say about the text? As if the text of Scripture is primarily a dogmatic handbook. Right? It's not. Uh, three quarters of it is historical narrative. It's telling this grand story, this mega narrative, if you will, of God's work across uh, history. Uh, if we only look in the right places, so the proof texter says, we'll know what to believe about baptism or about uh, uh, predestination, or about heaven, or whatever that case might be. Uh, no, that's not how we are to read. Uh, it seems to me we, we must look not only at the trees, but at the forest. Uh, uh, the second error, and surely maybe the one we're more culpable of, is reading our own context into the Bible. Um, as moderns, as late moderns, we are really good at doing this, right? Uh, we bring our issues, whether they're the political issues, whether they're the social issues of our time, uh, and we go and we look for a text that uh, supports our own cultural intuitions. Um, what does the Bible say about democracy? Precious little, actually, as a social political form. Now, it has a lot to say about human dignity, about individuals, about communities, and the like. It, it, you, can, you can find a lot of very interesting material there, but, but woe unto us if we read the text with our context in the first instance. 
uh, but rather in that uh, uh, canonical context. Uh, I, I close just with some thoughts uh, about how the Bible understood Jesus, working the other direction from where Jeff uh, began, namely at the beginning. Let me begin in the middle. Uh, Jesus says on the road to Emmaus, that wonderful uh, encounter with the two disciples asking Jesus, not knowing who he was, uh, what in the world just happened. And then Jesus says to them, beginning with Moses, with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. In one sense, it's not unfair to say, as Bart might have said it when he was clear, which is not uh, all that often, uh, 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 that uh, the Bible can, you can start almost anywhere you want in the Bible and get everywhere else. Uh, uh, so it is, I think Jesus is saying, the whole thing is really, ultimately, about me. Uh, we don't normally read the text like that, but if you look at Matthew, where does Matthew begin telling the story of Jesus? With this remarkable genealogy that takes us back uh, uh, through David uh, to Abraham. He's obviously making a legal point about uh, the fulfillment of the law in Jesus. Mark goes back to John the Baptist, the last of the Old Testament prophets, uh, the one who is uh, like Elijah, has preparing the way of the Lord. Uh, Luke uh, uh, tells the story of the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to not merely Adam, uh, but to God, that Jesus is in the lineology, uh, in the genealogy the lineage of both Adam and God. Uh, and John, of course, starts with that uh, a recapitulation of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning uh, uh, was the Word. The Word was uh, uh, with God. The Word was God. So each of the gospel accounts of Jesus require of us to know uh, the story before Jesus arrived, before the incarnation. Uh, uh, that is to say, if we are to take the Bible on its own terms, uh, uh, we must wrestle with uh, all of it. Uh, I close then with um, just the methodological point that Don Carson has made frequently of late, that there are these big themes all across uh, that run all the way through the Bible, and we need to pay attention to them. Uh, Jeff mentioned uh, covenants. Uh, you can put the whole book together through the covenants. It's not a minor theme uh, in Scripture. I, I think you can also put it together uh, through the language of the temple, the presence of God, uh, the priesthood, uh, atonement, uh, kingdom. Um, uh, I think there are uh, these big themes, exodus and exile, pilgrimage narratives, uh, that uh, hold the whole together. So if you read the beginning and the end, these themes are emphasized. There are lots of smaller sub-themes that really are interesting. I've done some work on the way in which the Bible uses the language of eyes. Seeing but not seeing, hearing but not hearing. This uh, uh, kind of anthropomorphic understanding of uh, knowing. Uh, so it is with trees. Trees are very interesting in Scripture. Um, uh, 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 they tie lots of different kinds of passages together. Uh, sermon this morning talking about adultery. It's actually a pretty common theme throughout Scripture. Right? It's connected to idolatry. It's also connected to this little human community called the family. Husbands, wives, children, sonship uh, language. A uh, whole host of themes that connect uh, the Scriptures uh, together. Uh, so, uh, uh, maybe we'll just leave it there and ask now uh, you to jump into the conversation at, with us about the nature of biblical theology. Thank you. Let, let's have the questions and let's make sure the questions are questions, not statements. You can make a quick statement before the question, but no, it's so we can have a maximum amount of questions asked. As the saying goes, qui tacit consented, which means if you don't say anything, you agree with everything we've said. <laughs> we can all go home. Uh, I don't know if I should stay it up. All right, I'll stay it up. <laughs>
Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for uh, just putting this together and, and talking. Um, and I guess I had a question. Uh, I know today in the field of biblical theology, there's a lot of different uh, tomes trying to pull it all together under certain themes. And I know in like the reform community, under the influence of, like John Piper and John Edwards, uh, the glory of God is kind of seen as like a meta theme of everything. Would you be able to comment on uh, the feasibility of that and what is meant by the glory of God and uh, mm -hmm. all of that? Well, I'll, I'll say something about that. Um, you know, first of all, I think it's important to understand what God's glory is. And I think that a thorough investigation of that um, probably points in the direction of the Holy Spirit. When In John's Gospel, when the Lord does a miracle, they beheld his glory. And of course, everything he did was by the Spirit. The words he spoke were Spirit, the miracles, and all the rest of it. Um, in Ezekiel 1, 28, the vision of the exalted man that uh, Ezekiel sees, uh, this uh, glory revelation of God, um, it's, it's accounted for in verse 28 as the likeness, demuth, the same word as in Genesis 1:26. God's going to make the Adam, the earthling, in his likeness. It's the likeness of the kavod, likeness of the glory of God, which I think points in the direction, as Peter talks about the spirit of glory and of God, the, the glory is the spirit, and God actually has the form of his own spirit. He's a temple of himself. A lot of things involved in the study of that concept. And so when you're talking about God, I think you're really talking very much in terms of the spirit. And since I believe uh, that all things were made through the word, but it was the spirit working through the pre-incarnate word, just as the spirit worked through the incarnate word to do the things of the new creation that Jesus was bringing into the world, um, you might say there's a sense in which everything is sure it's about the glory of God because without the glory spirit, none of it would exist. Um, I, I think it's I, it's, I would kind of put this in the category that um, Dr. Lentz, uh, Lentz's uh, uh, list of possible themes uh, articulated. Um, and I really do, I, <laughs> there are many different ways to look at it. But I would suggest that, that even glory could be understood, uh, subsumed under, if you will, or understood in terms of covenant. Because uh, the Lord's, it's the Lord's involvement with creation by his spirit in the first place that produced the first covenantal relationship. And then his spirit's at work, I think, again, per Hebrews 1.3, he sustains all things, things by the word of his power, but I believe it's the spirit through the word. So it's all very much, we are much more indebted to the spirit than we realize. And I just don't say this as a charismatic. I think this is a biblical fact. Um, so, I mean, I, I, uh, that kind of approach is fine. All these approaches are fine. I mean, so let's posit that I'm correct and that the really governing category ought to be God in terms of his covenantal relationships with people, which includes temple, which includes salvation, which includes the work of the spirit, the glory, and all, all these other things. Let's say I'm right about that. Um, that doesn't mean that all these other things shouldn't be pursued and can be fruitful. Um, let me just add a word since you mentioned Piper. He's a dear brother, uh, but I, you know he wrote that book about justification, and it has been critiqued, and I think rightly so, because he argued that justification was God's, uh, that, that righteousness in the Bible was God's concern for his own glory, since you mentioned glory. And actually, if you study out the word righteousness in the Bible, and even in the ancient Near East, the term righteous or righteousness has to do with conformity to a standard. We have Aramaic inscriptions which describe an heir to a throne as a righteous king. It doesn't mean he was a good guy. It means he ascended to the throne of his father according to the standard by which one should inherit the throne. He was a legitimate heir. He was not a pretender. Um, I've done an appendix on this in my second volume. I'm, I'm not going to do a book on it. It's way too much work, but uh, unless I really feel the Lord wanted me to. But I, I would submit that if one follows out those terms throughout the Bible, the Greek equivalents, um, the basic meaning will apply, conformity to a standard. And, of course, the standard is God. Um, so, But I'll just leave that on that note. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'd like to suggest Piper gets it right, at least in this sense, that God, 
is the center of the story. Um, and, and so whether glory is the center of the center, um, I, I'd rather probably suggest God's presence. We've got a, a, a relatively recently retired colleague of ours who promises that he's going to produce a biblical theology in the presence of God, uh, Gary Pratico. Uh, we're all waiting to see it. I, I do think that presence, divine presence, is a way uh, that the Bible organizes a, a lot of material. And his glory and his holiness, two dominant themes where you see presence, uh, come, come pretty close. And I think what, what is captivating about uh, Piper's vision in this regard is that it does uh, refocus our attention more nearly to what God is doing and what God is uh, than, than our response to God. And I think uh, Jeff picked up this theme uh, that covenants uh, remind us uh, the Hittite uh, form and, and the way in which God uses this form calls attention to the divine initiative in the covenants. Uh, so, um, yeah. Can I just follow up on that really, yeah. really, really briefly because I think it's worth noting, and, and you know, there's no way you're going to remember everything you've heard here today, but uh, here's my take on that. Um, first of all, Moses, having been brought up as a prince of Egypt, would have had a diplomatic education. He would have known that Hittite treaty form that was in use in his day. He's a perfect, well, just like Paul with his great education, a perfect choice to write what God wanted him to write. However, um, I think it goes deeper than that, because I would suggest that in Genesis 1, we're getting the true elements of how God related to what he made. And so the nature of God in relationship to his creatures and creation, those are the things that it contains. He is the great king. He provides good things for his vassal. He blesses. He has holy requirements and so on. Later Hittites, later on, made in the image of God. If, and, and so that describes a power relationship. The relationship of the great king to everything he's made. The Hittites later, having an empire, being made in God's image, quite naturally arrived at, or perhaps under common grace even giftedly, arrived at a treaty form which articulated a power relationship very well. And that ends up appearing again in Genesis 1. So it sort of comes full circle. Is that making sense? Is that, so so it, is, it exists everywhere in the world. If you have a job, you're in, that kind, you're in a power relationship. You have a boss, a suzerain, who provides good things for you, a workspace, maybe a car for your job, whatever, a computer. Uh, and there are blessings if you do well, right? You might get a pay raise. You might get a position raise. There are curses if you do badly. You might get a pay cut. You might be demoted. You might be fired. These are the essential elements. And they come from God because that's the way he is, and we're made in his image. Um, Dr. Lentz, your comment about how we read our own culture into theology and find our own themes in there. I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on how do we notice ourselves doing that? What, what should the filter or the check be in our mind mm. as we're doing theology? Did you hear that? How, what, what filters might we have to inhibit our cultural intuitions uh, interpreting the text? I, 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 a couple of thoughts there. Um, Read outside of your culture and read outside of your time. Uh, so uh, it's always helpful to read uh, the church historically to get a sense in which the, the, the book uh, was read outside of our times. And I think it's also helpful um, at the uh, kind of just seeing the Bible as a, a whole piece of literature, see the way other cultures read it, uh, and how oftentimes strange they see the themes we're interested in, uh, and how unusual uh, um, they seem to us. So, I, and I think the ways in which we bump into different theological traditions uh, in a place like Gordon Conwell is another piece of that. I, I do think the ways in which we understand difference uh, makes a difference. Uh, and so no guarantees there. It's not a mechanical process. 
um, raising children, some of your children get it and some don't. Uh, I wish there were a magical formula. I wish I could have the 10 rules that uh, will, if you follow them, uh, you will perfectly read the scripture. No. Um, so it's a living, you know, oftentimes uh, as Jesus is referred to as the living word, his words are referred to as living. They're, they're, they've got life in them, uh, which means it's uh, dangerous for us to suppose we can put it under our microscope, hold it under our box. Um, need to let it, let it be fresh. Just some thoughts. Other questions? It's a lot easier to moderate this than a political debate. <laughs> you guys are very nicely behaved. <laughs> yeah, actually, I have a question concerning the relationship with uh, biblical theology and the covenant theology. So when covenant theology uh, first came into being, it's much more like a sound like a systematic theology, like by uh, Jews. But I mean, like uh, by later efforts, like uh, uh, Melitus Klein, uh, covenant theology more and more like sound like uh, biblical theology, but still there's a lot of a camp in this covenant theology, and uh, people divided uh, how they are related to biblical theology. So my question is for uh, Jeff Nihaus, uh, uh what your opinion about the relationship of covenant theology and the biblical theory? Do you think covenant is a the Biblical theology or just one kind of biblical theology? <laughs> well, I, what I try to make clear, and I hope will be clear, is that I, I perfectly, anyone who wants to explore the Bible theologically and not do it as a systematic theologian, say, but as a biblical theologian, um, should feel free to, and indeed indebted, to go where the Spirit would lead him or her. So I do think that's got to be the ground of all of our behaviors and activities. Um, but, uh, but so as for covenant theology and biblical theology, I, I think uh, what uh, Dr. Lentz has said about biblical theology, what Dr. Uh, McDonough has said uh, about the way it follows themes historically, progressively through the Bible, uh, that's very good. Um, I think I've, sort of what I pointed out about how you learn more about God through the, subse su the, the subsequent, the successive covenants, that's along the same lines. It's a more organic literary sort of development. Um, covenant, the, and so covenant is just one of those things. Covenant, the, if, you look at, if you look at the Bible in terms of the successive covenants, you, um, you learn more as you go along. It is also, it's following that progress in terms of a certain category, namely how God relates to people through covenants. Covenant theology, and so I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, but classically, covenant theology has meant um, a, a, an, a, an understanding of the covenants as follows. God made a covenant with the, the first man and woman. They were not fallen. Uh, and that's called a covenant of works because not being fallen, they could have done the work. They fell, and so henceforth any covenantal relationship that God is going to institute has to be a, a matter of grace. And so God does these different covenants, Noahic, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, New, um, and they are put under one umbrella and called the covenant of grace. Now, that way of arranging things is not the best use of the data because we now know differently about covenants. Well, something I pointed out at the beginning, the Noahic covenant renews the Adamic. So it's not under a separate program. It's not under, it's not a, under a set. Well, and that's another thing. <laughs> Nobody in the ancient world would have got a collection of different covenants and called them a covenant. I it just, you know, I'm not in Moses' head. I can't be, but I, 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 and I'm not a betting man, but I would bet that if you could ask Moses, he'd say, what? Where did that, where'd that come from? What are you thinking? No, that's not the way they thought about covenants. So call it a program, that's fine. You want to say it's a program of grace. God reinstitutes the Adamic covenant with Noah through him for all humanity, for the world. And then in that context, he starts the, the special grace program. If you want to call all of it a program of grace, that's okay. Noahic through the new, it's a program, but it's not a covenant. That's a 17th century misunderstanding. One scholar has said there are two types of covenants, the ones that the Bible identifies as covenants 
and the types of covenants that are constructed by theologians. I think you ought to junk the second category because that's just not true to the evidence. We've got theologians and scholars writing today who just don't understand this, frankly, because they don't understand covenants from the ancient Near East. That's why scholar, no scholar understands everything. You've got to know that. Uh, so, you know, but I'm just saying, so the better way to look at this, I think, is not the way covenant theology held it, that you've got a covenant of works and then you've got a covenant of grace that includes everything else, but rather you've got a common grace set, the Adamic and Noahic, and then you've got a special grace program, starting with the Abrahamic, and those are all individual covenants that are part of a program. And incidentally, every covenant entails works. So I don't even like that characterization, you know. Every covenant entails works. Even ours, we have the obedience of faith, you know. We should be doing the works God calls us to do. Um, so it's a question of how you understand it. But just so you understand that covenant theology is a whole different construct. And I think it, it's, it, it, it's, you, you got, I'm all about the evidence. You gotta look at the data and go with the data. And so we had this scheme of covenants that has been wonderful for two centuries or more, three centuries, um, but we now know better. We know enough, so, we, we don't, you know, so I wouldn't use that schema anymore. That's classic covenant theology. People ask me, are you a covenant theologian? I'd like to be able to say yes, because I like covenants, but I'm not a covenant theologian in the classic sense. Next question. Yeah, let me just jump in a, uh, a brief bit. We associate uh, classic covenant theology uh, with post-Reformation Reformed uh, communities and post-Reformation Lutheran communities. Very different kinds of, of uh, uh, understandings of covenant. I, what I don't want to lose, and I think what Professor Niehaus is arguing for, is that uh, that development... Uh, was aimed at the claim that there actually is a plan, a divine plan from beginning to end. Uh, uh, and so whether there is one and only one description of covenants as covenants of works or covenants of grace, uh, however that uh, paradigm works, the, the covenantal language so prevalent in the post-Reformation period, both among the Reformed and the Lutherans, uh, was this notion that the Bible is held together by so, some divine structured intention. Now, I, I will say uh, 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 that there are a host of themes that run from the beginning to the end, and I, I think we ought to be uh, aware of how diverse those themes can be without supposing there are many diverse messages. This is, the, this is the danger here in drawing out, uh, you can follow kingdom, you can follow covenant, you can follow law, you can follow family, you can follow uh, land. All of these are these great biblical themes, and sometimes the hidden intuition is, uh, therefore the Bible doesn't really hold together as one story. Uh, uh, so uh, I want to... Um, put brakes on that and argue that the Bible is thick and rich and like a really good novel, like a really good drama, like a really good movie is complex. Uh, but there is a way to get from the beginning to the end uh, that is coherent. Uh, and that's the challenge for us in doing biblical theology. Next question. Thanks uh, for doing this, as another gentleman mentioned. Um, so, Dr. Lenz, you mentioned it's you can sort of get anywhere from anywhere in the Bible. And then, Dr. Niehaus, you talked about uh, covenant, and it seems to really begin at the beginning. Um, can you, any of you talk about how we go about navigating the waters of going one way when we're doing biblical, biblical theology and, and sort of going other ways when we're doing biblical theology and how we can sort of do that. Let, let's pull in uh, Dr. McDonough for that too. <laughs> well, I mean, it's easy for the New Testament because you just got to <laughs> perpetually keep yeah. in mind the, the rooting of everything that's going on in the Old Testament. So just speaking to my first point, to do New Testament exegesis is in effect to do yeah. biblical. biblical theology. I mean, um, Dr. Lentz mentioned the beginning of Matthew, uh, Biblos Genesios Jesu Christo, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, that phrase shows up in Genesis 5.1. This is the book mm -hmm. of the genealogy of Adam. Um, 
And so, and you could translate it literally as Biblos Genesios, the book of Genesis of Jesus Christ. So arguably it goes right back to um, Matthew, uh, I mean, uh, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Um, likewise, when you know that, and you know John 1 is in the beginning was the word, and et cetera, patent allusion to Genesis, then you start to notice that Mark's gospel starts arche, the, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and, and it suddenly doesn't look like a, particularly a coincidence. Um, so, uh, f- for instance, regularly in class, probably the most <clears throat> practical pastoral application I have for New Testament uh, understanding is that the exodus is probably the fundamental motif that drives the understanding of the early church. You have been delivered through baptism, just like passing through the Red Sea, and in the, I like to say, the great mall map of the cosmos, you are here equals the wilderness. You are en route to the promised land. You have not yet arrived at the promised land. That's the pastoral instruction Paul gives explicitly in 1 Corinthians 10. It's the pastoral wisdom that drives the book of Exodus, I mean the book of Revelation writ large. It, I think, undergirds the book of James. It's, it's clearly there in the book of Hebrews, and I think all four gospels, one way or another, um, have that paradigm. When you have that big picture in mind, then suddenly these questions of can I lose my salvation as if it were a decanter of water or your appendix or something, you see the absurdity of that framing. That yes, you have in fact been delivered, but you are on the journey and you simply, it's not simply the case that if you're elect you will persevere, though that may well be true, but you need to persevere. You need to continue the journey until you are in the promised land. Um, and, and so that, that narrative undergirds not only the narratives of the New Testament in the Gospels and Revelation, it also, I think, demonstrably undergirds the pastoral instruction evident in 1 Corinthians 10 and, and James in Hebrews in particular. So uh, you just do your exegesis with the awareness that you're always looking back in order to look at what's in front of you. So, so yeah. what you're saying, we, we can't be like Mr. Bean, never looking in our rearview mirror. <laughs> yes, yes. We always got to look at Let me just uh, tease that out uh, with some concrete examples. We have two colleagues uh, at different ends of this interpretive scheme, and I don't mind using their names since they're both dear friends. Uh, 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 behind one end of that spectrum, uh, uh, Gordon Hugenberger uh, sees uh, almost everything in every text, uh, and Professor Stewart sees barely anything in every text. Uh, what we call the minimalist uh, hermeneutic and the maximalist uh, hermeneutic. Both those traditions belong uh, here. Uh, We've referenced Meredith Klein. Meredith Klein could see more in a text than almost anybody else. Uh, And I remember a a Sunday school uh, he taught once, and this wonderful scribbling uh, uh, model that he had, and by the end of the class, he was writing in every direction, and it was uh, it was chaotic. Uh, a dear friend said to me uh, as we were leaving, "That was brilliant." I didn't understand a single word, but it was brilliant. Uh, 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 and I put Professor Niehaus in the middle here. Let the evidence determine how much you see in any text. Uh, but I will say. I lean towards the Hugenbergian, Kleinian end of that spectrum because I think um, the word is really thick. It's really rich. And sometimes we don't give it enough credit as a divinely authored book uh, that has this uh, incredible uh, ability to hold together. I use the metaphor sometimes of the movie Crash. Uh, It's a wonderful uh, movie. uh, the first time you see it, it's a series of uh, encounters between disparate, what appear to be arbitrary individuals, and then slowly your stereotypes from those initial conversations begin to turn upside down as further encounters take place, and then you go back and you watch it from the beginning and you see a whole different movie the second time through, uh, because you know the end. Uh, and you look for different clues. So I, I, I think uh, the more we read the whole book, the more we understand the whole book. Uh, but I will say reading is an art and not merely a science. Um, and, and I think that's the challenge uh, 
for us. Uh, different people read books differently. Uh, but woe unto us if we see the Bible simply as a newspaper article that can be read in five minutes and you get it, right? This strange Christian phenomena that we read the book again and again and again and again says something about the nature of the book. Um, and that's the point. Question. Yeah, I'm curious that none of you have referred to the larger meta narrative of Scripture creation, fall, redemption, final restoration. How does that meta narrative relate to the particularities of biblical theology? Mm-hmm. How does it inform it, guide it? Yeah. I'll take a, a shot at it. I think it's been implicit in what I've been saying, the way I put it together. And again, this is just a heuristic kind of a thing. There are other things you could say, but. Uh, getting some help from uh, Jacques Ellul, good Frenchman, <laughs> French sociologist, Bible scholar. I think I like to say creation, counter-creation, which is humanity's attempt to hijack the creation project on its own terms. So you see it in Lamech, Noah's dad. You see it in um, Babel uh, in, in there in Genesis 11, and not coincidentally tied in with Babylon, both in its Old Testament guys and then its sort of paradigmatic uh, appearance in, in uh, Revelation. So you have creation, counter-creation, decreation, which is God dismantling both the human attempt at counter-creation as well as his own handiwork. He's willing to take it apart. If you don't believe that, wait a few years and you'll begin to experience it quite personally and viscerally um, in your own personal decreation. Um, and then recreation, uh, where he he makes all things new, as he declares in Revelation uh, 21. So, yeah, that narrative, I think, is, is governed both by those dynamics, which show up a, a, a wee bit in um, the, the Old Testament and then are, are kind of uh, take on a cosmic scale in the new. I mean, even thanks to Carol Kaminsky, recognized even when Adam's created, I, I thought for, like, my whole life Adam was created in Eden. I just sort of assumed that, but it's not. He's it not only says God created them and then put them in Eden, it says he caused him to rest. So the quest for rest, right, the sense of exile and the need for return. And here, have I swapped out a different meta narrative? I don't know. I think I've just swapped out a different angle on the same, the same great story. Uh, that Another way to frame it is the quest for return home, um, back to God. So, Is the moderator allowed to ask a question? Surely, it doesn't matter. As long as, you can, as, so. as long as it's as long as it's a good one. Yeah. How about <laughs> sacrifice? Do you, anybody cares to? I mean, this is such a big deal in the mm. Gospels, the fi- the week, uh, the Passion Week. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 oh, let me pick up uh, President's question and then come back to this oh, okay. uh, sacrifice question. I uh, without. Uh, there's an arbitrariness to some extent uh, here, uh, but I would take those to be the grand theological categories of the whole book rather than the biblical theological categories of the book. So the fall uh, is, is um, in one sense, theologically, it runs from Genesis 3 to probably the new heavens and the new earth, although you know, we have to uh, reinterpret it somewhere with Jesus. Uh, but if we look at that, the, the way in which the Bible describes uh, uh, the fall, it clearly connects uh, with Israel's temptation in the wilderness and Jesus' great temptation, uh, Luke 4, Matthew 4. Uh, those three passages follow the same kind of literary uh, style. Uh, Jesus refers back to Deuteronomy 6 and 8 in his temptation narratives, and those temptation narratives in 6 and 8 clearly have echoes of uh, Genesis uh, 3 in them. Now, that to say, I think we need both the theological categories, uh, creation, fall, redemption, consummation, and uh, these... um, biblical theological threads that appear to be the literary structures of the text themselves. That, that, that I take to be the point. And so to the sacrifice uh, theme, 
for sure, it's an enormous theme across the, the canon uh, and uh, interconnected with so many and disconnected with so much of our modern intuition. I mean, I think that's probably the greatest of the challenges to understand what in the world is sacrifice and why does the offering of a life, an animal life, for example, have anything to do with how um, uh, we relate to God. Uh, that it's just counterintuitive that it would make any sense. Uh, and part of the challenge for us is to see how significant the language of sacrifice, of atonement, uh, is all across the, the canon and the way in which uh, Jesus uses this language so prominently as a description of his mission. Um, and that can feed right back into the systematics, right? Because you've got plenty of theologians from Irenaeus right up to Bart who want to argue that, that the real centerpiece of God's work is, is in fact the, the redemptive work of Christ, such that even creation, they want to reframe it and say there's this kenosis of self-giving. So some theologians want to put sacrifice right at the very core of God's being, or at least his being for us. So it, it's an interesting example of where a, a theme that could be overlooked in, in two hours worth of discussion, or however long we've been going at it, um, turns out to be present, as you've, you've advised us to, and it turns out to be really an important cornerstone for that tertiary or secondary level of theological synthesis. So, just Yeah, I would just add that, uh, I mean, the logic of it, I think, is really, in a <clears throat> sense, uh, to quote Sherlock Holmes, simplicity itself. You know, he never said it's elementary, my dear Watson. Uh, he never said that. Simplicity itself. But so, yeah, for your sin, either you give up the life of the one who gave you life because you <clears throat> rebelled against him by sinning, or you, by his grace, he provides a substitute, be it an animal under the old covenant or his son under the new. But let's never assume that because we understand the, the simple logic of the construction there that we've understood the why. I mean, I've often thought, if I were God and I were love, and I knew before, I mean, we're all, we've already been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, Paul says, so we understand that before God created anything, the eschaton was already over for him. Um, and so if you were God and you were love and you knew that these two humans you made in your image were going to do what they did and most of the human race would perish horribly, why would you do it? Even if you did provide the atoning sacrifice in your own son, why would you do that? And that's the why. That's the why of it all, and I don't think anyone can answer that. However, I'm convinced that when I'm with the Lord, I'll know he was right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Last one. Probably one of the last questions. Okay, so I have um, a question that I should have asked Klein when I was his student, <laughs> but didn't because I was already in enough trouble with Klein that I didn't want to make my life any worse. Which comes first, hermeneutics or exegesis? Hmm. Well, I think you uh, probably, most people approach the work of exegesis with some hermeneutical assumptions or perspectives. I think that's probably unavoidable. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's an iterative process, right? Yeah. You're th thrown this. We're thrown into the middle of this, and we have some theories which are adequate, and they get us a certain distance, and we realize that we're not quite hearing things as well as we can, and so we go back and re-engineer the theory and it enables us to see th some things and then we realize that didn't, so, but well, you're the. Let me just add too, I don't, it's, it's not a given that the assumptions would be conscious. Sure. You know, so. Yeah, I, I do think we have to start with exegesis before we get to hermeneutics, just methodologically. But, but I think it, in some ways, what exegesis is asking, what, what is the meaning of this text? inevitably forces you to do hermeneutics uh, at some level. Uh, words are both profoundly simple, what does a word mean, and profoundly complex. Uh, uh, and that's the wonderful uh, task we have as interpreters uh, uh, for the life of the church, that we are, as pastors, preachers, teachers, um, spending a lifetime expounding the meaning of words uh, that uh, God has spoken. And uh, that's a, an enormously significant uh, challenge and, and task for us. And, and I do think in our time, and we just close with this, in our time, the, the biblical illiteracy, 
forces upon uh, those in ministry a much greater obligation to do really careful exegesis uh, and uh, really rich uh, biblical theology. Because we live in a time uh, where the Bible is not known. Um, it's, it is a strange and foreign reality. Uh, but that's our, our great mission. Well, I feel we've just the tip of the iceberg and we could be here all afternoon asking questions, but you know what? What you can do is you can take classes with them <laughs> and then you can go in depth. So thank you so much.